Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. At any time throughout today's presentation, you may submit your questions electronically by using the Ask a Question box located to the left of your webinar interface. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Ms. Melissa Bjorklund. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Personalized Medicine and Colorectal Cancer webinar. We're excited to have you with us. Uh, as David said, my name is Melissa Bjorklund, and I'm joined right now by my colleague, Randy Henniger, as well as Kim Ryan from Fight Colorectal Cancer and our speaker, Dr. Allison Ocean. So before we get started, I want to thank our friends at Fight Colorectal Cancer for their partnership on this webinar, and especially our volunteers and buddies and all of you callers for joining us today. So I'll start with a quick introduction to the Colon Cancer Alliance, and then Kim will give an overview of Fight Colorectal Cancer's programs and then we'll kick it over to Dr. Ocean for the uh, meat of this webinar. So as I mentioned, my name is Melissa. I'm the Patient Support and Outreach Senior Coordinator here at the Colon Cancer Alliance, and we are the nation's oldest and largest patient advocacy organization dedicated to colon cancer. Our mission is to knock colon cancer out of the top three cancer killers. And um, we're doing this by championing prevention, funding cutting edge research, and providing the highest quality patient support services. So our patient support programs, like this webinar, are the heart and soul of our organization. I wanted to just give a quick run through of what we offer for patients, survivors, family members, and advocates. So our newest program, which we're really excited about, is the Patient Support Navigator Program. And it serves patients through the entire continuum of care, so from screening to diagnosis and treatment, and then on through to survivorship. And in addition to our Patient Support Navigator Program, we offer a toll-free helpline, an online community with a live daily chat, a peer-to-peer -peer buddy support program, and a financial assistance grant through our Blue Note Fund. Additionally, our community outreach volunteer program is the backbone of the Colon Cancer Alliance. So we wouldn't be where we are if it weren't for the passionate volunteers who impact their communities around the country. I also wanted to mention that National Colon Cancer Awareness Month is coming up. Um, if you don't have plans for March and would like to get involved, we'd love to connect with you and help you get something started in your community. You can learn more at colincancermonth.org, and I'd also encourage you to join us on Facebook or Twitter for the latest news updates on what's going on. Finally, for more information about the Colon Cancer Alliance, or for our programs, or to listen to a replay of today's webinar, you can visit our website at www.ccalliance.org, or call our helpline at 877-422-2030. And now here's a brief word from Kim Ryan from Fight Colorectal Cancer. Thank you, Melissa. How is everyone today? Um, first, I, I'd like to start off by thanking the Colon Cancer Alliance uh, for this partnership. We, we join together with them on two webinars each year to kind of bring you the latest and greatest on the things that are happening out there in colorectal cancer research. And I just know that Dr. Ocean is going to do a great job of informing you of the, you know, the latest research that came out of the GI Symposium um, that was just this past January. So uh, just a little bit about Fight Colorectal Cancer. Um, I won't read you our mission statement there, but there's three different areas I would um, bring your attention to, and that is one of the things that we do is we educate patients. And so a couple of the ways that we do that is um, similar to the Colon Cancer Alliance via this monthly patient webinar series that we have. Um, and in addition to that, we also have an answer line that patients and caregivers can call into to ask any questions they have about their disease or diagnosis. Um, the second piece of our mission statement that I'd call your attention to is policy, and um, we have a, uh, an annual event called Call on Congress that happens um, on this, 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 this March 16th through the 18th, and that's a really great empowering event where we bring um, a bunch of advocates from all across the United States here to Washington, D.C., and teach them about being really good advocates and then actually send them right on up to Capitol Hill and make appointments um, with their members of Congress to talk to them about um, things that are important to not just colorectal cancer survivors, but to the entire colorectal cancer community. And then the last thing I bring your attention to is that we try and empower survivors. And um, we're really excited. We're, we have a campaign called One Million Strong. And this year we're kicking off um, 2014's One Million Strong and introducing a One Million Strong March in New York City on March 3rd. So we're super excited about that. Um, we're going to be hitting some of the, uh, the, the good morning shows, um, so look for us uh, in the audiences there. 
Uh, it's going to begin uh, at a day at Grand Central Station where we'll have some yoga classes and, and a big dance party. We're going to do a very big bowel renewal ceremony, and that will lead into an actual march, a one million strong march that will take us all down through the, seat, the, the streets of New York City and end up at Times Square where some of our uh, advocates will be going inside to ring the NASDAQ bell, and the rest of us will be outside in Times Square um, waiting for the latest of uh, colorectal cancer's public service announcements to air right on the boards there um, in New York City. So um, we're super excited about that event, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in March for colorectal cancer, but there is a lot of stuff going on all throughout the year. So I would just encourage you guys to stay connected with us whatever way is best for you. You can visit our website there at psychcolorectalcancer.org. And as you can see, we're pretty connected with all of our social media. So connect with us however you can, and um, always feel free and reach out if you should have any uh, questions or want to learn more about our organization. So thanks again to Calling Cancer Alliance for having us, and I will turn it back over to you because I'm sure everyone's looking forward to hearing from Dr. Ocean. For sure. Thank you, Kim. And so here's Randy to tell us a little more about Dr. Ocean. Thank you, Melissa and Kim. My name is Randy Henniger. I'm a 28-year colon cancer survivor and a member of the Colon Cancer Alliance's patient support team. And I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Allison Ocean, who's a medical oncologist and attending physician in gastrointestinal oncology, solid tumor division, at New York's Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell Medical Center. She's assistant Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Weill Medical College of Cornell University and a medical oncologist at the J. Manahan Center for Gastrointestinal Health. She's board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and medical oncology. Dr. Ocean's primary interest is in the biology and treatment of gastrointestinal malignancies such as colorectal, pancreatic, stomach, biliary, and liver cancers. She also specializes in head and neck cancers and neuro and I knew I was going to mess up on that one. Neuro and help me, Dr. Ocean. Endocrine, <laughs> neuroendocrine. Thank you, neuroendocrine tumors. That, thank you, Dr. O, uh, Ocean's clinical research focuses on the use of radio-labeled monoclonal antibodies on colitic viral therapies, which I'm very interested in learning more about since I can hardly pronounce, and novel targeted agents. In her clinical practice, Dr. Ocean believes in the provision of not only state-of-the-art treatment for her patients and families, but also in a comprehensive, compassionate, multidisciplinary approach to their care and support. Dr. Ocean graduated cum laude from Tufts University. She also graduated with honor from the Tufts University School of Medicine and completed her residency in internal medicine at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center. Dr. Ocean was chief fellow during her fellowship in hematology and medical oncology at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell Medical Center. Dr. Ocean is the author of numerous peer-reviewed articles and abstracts and is an active member of several professional societies, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Society of Hematology, and the American Association for Cancer Research. Dr. Ocean, these are impressive credentials and as a former patient, I especially appreciate your comprehensive, compassionate, multidisciplinary approach to patient and family care and support. Thank you for all you do and for sharing your knowledge with us today on this important subject. Dr. Ocean, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Randy. It's an honor to be here today to speak to all of you, to the Colon Cancer Alliance to Fight Colorectal Cancer, and to all the patients and caregivers and supporters who have dialed in today to learn about uh, what is the latest and greatest in, in how we treat colorectal cancer, and more importantly, how we treat your own disease, because the subject of today's talk is personalizing medicine in colorectal cancer. And I'm going to use the data that was presented at our annual meeting. Uh, we have a, a meeting once a year of about 25,000 oncologists all over the world that uh, meet up in um, in San Francisco, and we we present the latest data on, on different tumors. And so I'm going to uh, take present to you the salient points from the conference this year and how it relates to colon cancer. And then at the end of the discussion, I'll open up the floor to questions. And I have some questions already that I will 
um, that I've received from, from people who've registered, and I will tackle those as well. Okay, so let's get started. Can, um, I will advance to the first slide. Um, here we are. So this is a, just an overview of colon cancer in uh, today's epidemiology, 2013-2014. As many of you know, uh, it's the fourth most common cancer diagnosed in the United States, and there are about 150,000, 142,000 to be precise, new cases diagnosed in 2013, and the male-to-female ratio is equal, one-to-one. -one. It does represent the second leading cause of cancer death, with about 50,000 deaths from colorectal cancer each year. The good news is that there has been a steady decrease in the age-adjusted incidence rates of distal colon, proximal colon, and rectal cancers in the years that span 1976 to 2005. And I'm going to get into a little bit more about uh, rates of cancer in um, certain age groups in the, in the next few slides. Uh, and then this, this graph that is on, on this slide shows um, the distribution of, of the disease in different ethnicities. Uh, and um, it, that's just, just for, for more information that you can have. So what one abstract that was presented at ASCO GI this year, which, is, which I took as the most alarming and the most important information that we need to get out to the colorectal cancer community, is the rising rate of colon cancer, colorectal cancer, excuse me, both, both colon and rectum cancers, in young adults. The incidence is rising sharply in younger adults in the United States. This article that was presented looked at SEER data. SEER data is a big epidemiolo epidemiologic study uh, of where we collect data from many, many patients and looked at the data for 383,000 patients for whom colorectal cancer was diagnosed between 1975 and 2010. And churning through that data and analyzing it, what they did find was that the age-adjusted incidence of colorectal cancer fell steadily among those who were older than 50 years old. Okay, that makes sense. We're screening people starting at, at 50 years old with colonoscopies. But what doesn't make sense and what was I found alarming is that the annual percentage change in rates in patients aged 35 to 49 at diagnosis and especially aged 20 to 34 increased sharply. And the, the greatest rise was in the age 20 to 34 year olds. And these results were similar for colon and for the rectum, both. Because we have all this data from 380,000 patients, we can, uh, and the, the researchers did this, they, they came up with a predictive model that would suggest what would happen if these observed trends continue to persist from 2010 up until 2030. And what, if, that, if these trends continue to persist, the incidences of colon cancer and rectal cancer will rise by 90% and 124% among 20 to 34-year-olds. And so, so colon cancer will go up by 90%. Rectal cancer will go up by 124% in the 20 to 34-year-old age group. And then in the 35 to 49-year-old age group, the rise will be by 28% for colon cancers and 46% for rectal cancers. That, those numbers are staggering. Why is this happening? We don't exactly know some possible reasons for the increased incidence that we're seeing colorectal cancer in younger people, in people younger than the age of 40, and especially in the 20 to 34-year-old age group. Possible re reasons include increasing obesity rates, physical inactivity, a diet high in fat and red meat. Those are some of the factors that through the research that's already been done that are pointing to reasons why younger people are being diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Up until now, we've looked at other factors such as 
uh, viral causes, sexual practices, um, um, also more about the diet. And we haven't really found anything that is, quote, the reason why we are finding colon cancer earlier in younger people. The primary care doctors who are the, the first line of defense for people when they get sick, the, it may be that we're getting the word out to primary care doctors more more with screening so that when young adults present with symptoms like rectal bleeding, they may be more willing to refer these younger patients for to a gastroenterologist or for a colonoscopy because uh, in the past what many primary care doctors did is if a young patient came in with rectal bleeding, they most likely would say, oh, it's most likely hemorrhoids. Hopefully they would examine the patient and find hemorrhoids and not find a mass. And then they'd say, oh, this, this bleeding is from hemorrhoids and, you know, let me know what happens and, and go and, and come back if it, it continues to happen and send them home and then people forget about it. it may not may or may not happen again. And then these people who unfortunately the bleeding was due to a cancer may get diagnosed at a much later stage. But now primary care docs hopefully are more aware that this is an increasing problem in younger people and we will um, uh, hopefully be able to catch these cancers earlier because as you well know this is a preventable cancer if we catch polyps before they turn into cancers we can cure this disease this disease can even be eradicated if we can screen everybody in time to before the cancer develops that brings me to the next point was the screening age well the screening age is 50 years old unless someone has a family history or has a genetic cancer syndrome like Lynch syndrome or familial adenomatous polyposis. Otherwise, if you're just regular risk, you're, you're scre the screening age is 50. So with the data that is being presented like this, showing the increasing incidence of co colorectal cancer in younger people, we hope to take this data among other studies that have been done and bring this to the attention of the politicians and the um, the policymakers and the, the guideline makers to to try to um, get them to change the, the screening age to lower the screening age to, um, you know, lo younger than 50. I'm not sure what age they would lower it to, but um, the data sh this data shows that it should be at least lowered to 40, and if not, you know, earlier for to try and catch these things. But the problem with lowering the screening age is that it uh, we um, have the risks and benefits of of the actual procedure with screening colonoscopy. So um, that's why it's just it's not something that we can just easily reduce the age and say and make a mandate that you know from now on everyone who's 35 and older has to get a colonoscopy every year. Um, so, but the efforts of fight colorectal cancer with lobbying Congress and all the physicians that are involved in screening and prevention of colorectal cancer are working hard to uh, petition the policymakers to lower the screening age. And this is just one more important article to add to the body of data that is um, su highly suggestive that we should lower the screening age. The next slide is a pie graph that looks at the stage of diagnosis for colon cancer. And you can see that uh, all the stages are shown here. Stage zero, which is in situ, which means there are cancer cells in the polyp, but they have not invaded. Uh, stage one is, is um, it's r related to the depth of the tumor inside the colon and rectum in terms of very early stage. It's just in, this, in the um, mucosa, submucosa. Stage two is when it's going into the muscle but not all the way through the muscle and stage three is when lymph nodes are involved and stage four is when there's distant disease with metastases to another organ and about 20 percent of people are diagnosed with stage four disease metastatic disease at presentation uh, when they first find out about the cancer the um, stage three rate uh, diagnosis it, about 25 percent of patients are diagnosed with stage three meaning that the lymph node um, are positive after surgery, 
And then stage two is another 25%. There are no lymph nodes involved, but the tumor is present in the muscle, uh, and that's how stage two is diagnosed. And I just put this out there because I'm going to be talking about a few different different stages here, and I wanted you to know the incidence of at which, um, how many patients are diagnosed with what stage. So this is a typical um, slide that is shown at, men at medical conferences, w um, which is adapted from the NCCN guidelines. The NCCN guidelines are the clinical practice guidelines in oncology, and this is the most updated version, 2014, and this is the standard therapy algorithm for colon cancers, colorectal cancers, how we treat them. And it's divided up by stage. You can see stage one, two, three, and four on the right-hand side, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side of the, of the chart. And then on the uh, right-hand side is the treatments and divided up into colon and divided up into rectal. And for the earlier stage diseases, surgery is key. And then uh, some patients with stage two colon cancer do get chemotherapy in addition to surgery. Uh, for rectal cancer, it's treated differently because of the location of the rectum. Is is um, I, I almost kind of think of it as a different organ than the colon, even though it is the bottom, the, the most distal part of the large intestine. Um, it has a different behavior. It has a different blood supply, um, and it's treated differently. So we use radiation in, in combination with chemotherapy, followed by surgery, followed by chemotherapy again to treat rectal cancers, uh, and that's for stage two and stage three. And then for stage four disease or metastatic disease, uh, most patients are treated mostly with chemotherapy. Targeted agents are also included in, the, in that um, category of, of chemotherapy, as well as sometimes surgery for patients with stage four disease. So uh, we can come back to this as, as I talk about the different stages and the news that happened at the conference related to the different stages. So I'm first going to talk about early stage disease and what was presented at ASCO GI uh, this past January related to early stage disease. So patients that are diagnosed with stage two disease, so remember the, the tumor penetrates through the, the colorectal wall, but lymph nodes are not involved. And this is diagnosed after surgery, after the patient has the tumor taken out by the surgeon. So there is um, the, the treatment of stage two colon cancer is controversial at times. The majority of patients with stage two disease do not re uh, receive chemotherapy for six months after surgery because the benefit from chemotherapy is only a small improvement in, in um, survival. Um, for instance, if someone has stage two colon cancer and they have their surgery and then they have what we call a regular risk stage two colon cancer without any high risk features or any features of the cancer that would predict for recurrence, those patients usually are not offered chemotherapy because chemotherapy for a course of six months only improves their five-year survival by a few points when their five-year survival is very good to start with. And then chemotherapy, going through chemotherapy for six months with its side effects, doesn't really add that much to the overall survival, and those patients do well. However, there are a subset of patients with stage two disease who do recur, the cancer does come back, and and that represents about 15% of patients with stage two disease. We want to find out, well, which are the 15% of the patients that we think will recur and we, that we think we should treat more aggressively and offer those patients chemotherapy to try to reduce that risk of recurrence. We know that chemotherapy reduces recurrence risk and also improves overall survival in stage three disease, but for stage two disease, it's, it's um, it's not as clear cut. There is a test called Oncotype DX, which has been out for a few years now, which is a gene assay. Basically, the patient's tumor is submitted for testing, and a I think it's a 12-gene assay that is done to come up with a recurrence score for the cancer. And the 
recurrent score is based on certain molecular changes within the tumor that are detected on this on testing these 12 genes that produce a, a numeric score called a recurrent score and that score helps to predict what is the risk of recurrence in stage 2 disease this is a commercially available test so a pa patient who is diagnosed with stage 2 disease uh, can be offered this this um, this testing to be done sometimes it's necessary to do the testing because patients want to know the information. They want to know what their recurrence risk is precisely, and this gives us a number that we can say, oh, your recurrence score according to this test was X, Y, or Z. And patients then use that decision to, that, that score to decide about whether or not they want to take the six-month course of chemotherapy. There are features of the tumor that we get through the pathology report that tell us whether or not a patient's tumor is at high risk for recurrence. So we look at those features every day aside from doing the oncotype test to decide whether or not a patient should be offered chemotherapy. However, this test gives a little bit more information. I don't want to say it's better information, but it's a little bit more information to help come up with the decision of whether or not a patient should get chemotherapy. Now, the news about Oncotype DX that was presented at the conference this past year is they did a thorough analysis of what physicians recommend for stage 2 patients and for what patients' preferences are for treatment before or at and after receiving the Oncotype colon cancer test results. So what they showed was that doing this test greatly increased concordance between what the physician would have chosen to recommend treatment or not and what the patient's treatment choice was. So the test helped improve that. The recurrence score of this test also influenced a majority of patients' treatment decisions. 85% of patients their treatment was influenced by getting this test done, whether or not they wanted chemotherapy. And it also inf influenced physicians' treatment recommendations. Perhaps a, a doctor would, would see a higher recurrence score than otherwise they would have thought, and then the, therefore they would recommend chemotherapy for the patient. Um, the, another finding from the study was that patients' anxiety was also significantly reduced, which may improve adherence to their treatment plan and ultimately to better health outcomes. Uh, the, what they found was when they looked further at the study that was presented, that they did a review of four validation studies from the Oncotype DX colon cancer test. So 3,000 patients underwent this test with early stage, stage two colon cancer. And there was a significant association between the test results and the recurrence risk. So what that means is that completing this test was able to come up with a score that did predict someone's recurrence risk, and it was correct in the prediction. It wasn't like they came up with a score that was just they they it would say that your risk is is ninety percent that it's going to come back, and it really is only ten percent that it's going to come back. So the, they found it to be a, a test that was validated. So I think the take-home message of this study that was presented at, at ASCO was that the test, doing this test changed treatment recommendations in 29 to 45% of stage 2 colon cancer cases, which led to a net reduction in adjuvant chemotherapy use. So there were patients that may have decided that they wanted chemotherapy because they were scared that the cancer was going to come back. And they said, they will, oh, they'll, they'll take it anyway because they don't know what their risk is going to be. But after doing this test and getting a recurrence score, they felt much more comfortable with refusing the chemotherapy because of the, the little benefit that it would give them. So it, it, it relieved anxiety as well as led to a, a ultimately a net reduction in, in, in patients taking chemotherapy at four stage two colon cancer. So that's all I'm going to say about the Oncotype DX. The problem 
the test also is that it's not always covered by insurance. So if if you have been diagnosed with stage two colon cancer and you want this test done, um, or you think it'll be helpful for you to to um, to get the information from the test in, in helping decide to make a decision about chemotherapy, then I would speak to your doctor and hopefully it would be covered by insurance or the company itself would be able to run the test um, if they think it's going to be helpful in making the decision. So that's just something to ask your doctor about. And this is one of the ways that we can personalize the treatment decision because it's specifically looking at your own cancer and your own risk of recurrence, not just what a big uh, data quote is, you know, that 100,000 people had a recurrence risk of 20%. This is more specifically related to the features of your cancer. Okay. The next study I'm going to touch on was a study for rectal cancer that was presented at ASCO GI. And this was a very large phase three randomized trial in the neoadjuvant treatment of rectal cancer. And this was um, neoadjuvant treatment is the treatment that someone gets before surgery for rectal cancer. And so um, many patients historically were treated with a continuous infusion of 5-fluorouracil chemotherapy with radiation, meaning they wore a pump basically for an entire six weeks. The pump was on for six weeks straight, giving them 5-FU slowly every day for six weeks during the radiation process. And that's how it used to be done. Uh, more recently, in the, in the last 10 years, uh, a drug called capecitabine or Zolota, which is a pill, which is a oral formulation of 5-FU, has been used instead of the pump in combining it with radiation. And it was found in this large study, finally updated mature results, that using Zolota with radiation preoperatively, before op operation happens, is equally as effective as our old standby, the infusional 5-FU chemo, in terms of local regional recurrence rates. And that's what they looked at. Like, is using Zolota with, with radiation just as effective in preventing recurrences in the regional area of where the, the rectum is once it's taken out in that area? Is it equally effective? And yes, it is. So what does this mean? Well, this is the largest clinical trial showing no difference in clinical benefit, which is very important because now patients can take pills during the radiation, and this provides a better quality of life for patients. Patients aren't tied down to having catheter treatment. They're able to take an oral agent. Um, so that those are all very important um, features that this study um, presented to patients that, that now we, we have a, a much more convenient yet efficacious option. The other um, point of this study looked at whether or not oxaliplatin, which is a common chemotherapy used in the treatment of colorectal cancer, whether it should be added to the 5-FU infusion or to the Zolota pills in addition to the radiation. And what it was shown, what this trial showed was that adding oxaliplatin did not improve clinical response rates, meaning it did not shrink the tumor more. So we do not add oxaliplatin to the preoperative setting standardly at this time. There are many trials that are being done looking at what is the correct timing of oxaliplatin in the neoadjuvant setting for treatment for rectal cancer. Uh, but right now, it is not considered standard of care to use oxaliplatin in combination with 5-FU-based chemoradiation. On this point of what is the correct, where, what is the place of oxaliplatin, and what is the uh, what is the correct treatment we should do for patients with rectal cancer um, prior to surgery? Another study was presented at ASCO GI, and this study came from Spain, and this was a large trial. It was a phase two trial looking at preoperative or neoadjuvant treatment of rectal cancer. And what they compared was two different treatment modalities. The first one is using chemotherapy first, so an induction chemotherapy, meaning chemo alone, followed by chemoradiation, 
followed by surgery. That would be the experimental arm. And then the standard approach is what how we usually treat patients, chemo radio chemo radiation followed by surgery and then doing adjuvant chemotherapy in patients with locally advanced rectal cancer. So that's how we usually treat patients with rectal cancer. We do chemo radiation first, followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. And that whole process takes about six months. What this study showed is that for this group that was looked at, that there were equal response rates, equal recurrence rates, equal distant recurrence rates, the same survival, the same overall survival between the two approaches, and this was carried out to five years after their treatment. So this is not enough data because it was a uh, patient population of a few hundred people. This is not enough data to change the way we practice the treatment of rectal cancer. However, it is intriguing that uh, a, a trial is, is tipping the balance in favor of induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation and then surgery. What is the benefit of doing it that way? Well, there is less acute toxicity and there's better compliance to chemotherapy component in the regimen was identified with the induction approach over the standard approach. So people don't get as much acute toxicity if the chemo is started first followed by the chemo radiation. But we definitely need more large phase three trials to to um, define what's the best approach to treat patients with rectal cancer. Uh, if a patient of mine is, is diagnosed with rectal cancer now, um, I consider many factors of the, of the tumor, the location, the size, the other um, medical problems that the patient has, uh, the other um, patient preference, as well as um, you know, explaining to them what the standard approach is and what we're looking into as what's, what's considered new and experimental. And we come to a treatment decision together as to what's the best way to proceed. There are some patients' tumors that may be bulkier at first and maybe um, have a higher risk, may have a lot of lymph nodes involved at, at presentation. Those are the people that you may want to start chemotherapy in first, then have it shrink down, then follow it by radiation, and um, and then surgery. That's just one example of of why an induction approach may be more beneficial in in a certain patient. Uh, but knowing that 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 the standard approach is still to do chemo radiation first, followed by surgery, and followed by adjuvant chemotherapy, because that's what we have the most data on, and that's what's shown the best results so far. I'm next going to uh, speak about metastatic disease and the data from the conference regarding metastatic or stage 4 disease. When we look at how to personalize treatment for colorectal cancer, there are a lot of considerations that we have to think about when we're deciding about what is the correct treatment to offer someone. Yes, we have guidelines, but the guidelines don't have a patient standing in front of you who has, um, you know, who has other medical conditions, has other, um, uh, may have uh, different resources, personal resources, uh, may not have insurance, et cetera, all these things that we have to consider when we're personalizing treatment recommendations. Here's a list, uh, a long list of, um, uh, of, of factors that we have to look into when we're personalizing treatment decisions in colorectal cancer. So we look at the extent of disease. We look at what's the intent of the treatment. Is the intent to cure someone or is the intent to make them live as long as possible but unable to cure them, uh, how strong is the person, what's their performance score, that means how are they, are they very functional, are they very fit, would they be able to tolerate aggressive therapy, um, how old are they, what are their other medical conditions, how soon did they receive chemotherapy before they became metastatic. We definitely want to look at the molecular markers of the cancer, and I'll get into a bunch of that in a minute. Um, 
we have to look at their organ function, their their liver and kidney function, and also what are their risks for toxicity? Uh, act active? Uh, do they have active heart disease? Do they are they on a blood thinner? Do they already have neuropathy? Do they have irritable bowel syndrome? Do they have inflammatory bowel disease? Do they have interstitial lung disease? Do they have a problem with processing chemotherapy? Those are all things that we have to consider when we're, we're coming up with the best treatment consideration for patients. And then, very importantly, convenience. Uh, patients want to have a, a good quality of life. They don't want to be tied down to uh, the doctor and coming to the doctor, you know, every, you know, all, all the time. Um, we cost and resources is very important, and and also very important is patient preferences and patient goals. So we look at all of these factors in deciding on uh, treatment considerations for for metastatic colon cancer. The first major data that was presented at ASCOGI this year regarding stage 4 disease is um, the Cairo 3 data. And this data provided guidance to oncologists about how big of a treatment holiday should we give patients following their first treatment with chemotherapy. So patients get, unfortunately, get diagnosed with about 20% of the of patients get diagnosed with stage four disease at diagnosis. And when this happens, sometimes they do get surgery for, to take out the primary cancer. Uh, sometimes uh, the primary cancer is left in place and uh, they get started on chemotherapy. Uh, sometimes the goal is to use the chemotherapy to shrink things down and then to go for surgery. So if the intent is to treat a patient with chemotherapy the first line, meaning the first time they're treated, that's called first-line therapy, if the intent is to use chemotherapy, the standards of care are treatments with drugs that you have already heard me speak about, 5-FU, oxaliplatin, or Zolota and oxaliplatin. And another drug that is part of the standard regimen for treating stage 4 disease in a majority of patients is Avastin or Bevacizumab. And this study looked at patients that are getting an induction therapy, meaning the first treatment they get, of Zolota, Oxaliplatin, and Avastin. And they get that for three months. And then the question that a lot of people have is, well, how long do we have to do this for? Maybe the tumor is shrinking. Uh, hopefully it is shrinking. Do, do, pe do patients always ask me, how long do I have to be on this for? Do I have to be on chemo forever? Well, we, don't, we have to do trials to figure out what, how will we achieve the best outcome in these people. So this is a trial that looked at maintenance treatment after patients got the initial uh, six, uh, sorry, three months of, of the the um, Zolota, Oxaliplatin, and Avastin. And it was found that if patients continued on Zolota and Avastin and dropped the Oxaliplatin, they, their time to disease progression was significantly prolonged, and that's good. We don't want this disease to come back. We want to prolong the time as long as we can until it comes back because in patients that we can't cure, we want to extend their life. And the longer that we can keep it at bay and and not coming back, the longer the patient will live. So what this study showed was that there was a survival benefit to maintain treatment rather than giving someone a complete treatment holiday and saying, okay, you don't have any disease right now or your disease is, is very minimal, you, you should be off all treatment. Uh, that was one arm of the study, and that the, the patients that were on that arm of the study didn't do as well as the patients that got maintenance therapy. So that is an important data point that oncologists use to decide how much treatment a patient should have. The next group of studies for um, improving outcome in colorectal cancer patients looked at prognostic and predictive information. And this is where we get more into markers and personalized medicine and what does my tumor show and, um, and a lot of talk about a gene called KRAS. So before I get into 
the nitty gritty about all this. I want to just uh, explain that we do, um, in patients that are diagnosed with stage four disease, we, uh, on the tumor biopsy itself, we request testing of a gene called KRAS. And in about 40% of colon cancers, colorectal cancers, that are metastatic, the gene KRAS is mutated. And that means that this, the DNA inside the cancer cell is messed up. It's, it has a mutation. It doesn't work right. And what that mutation does is it promotes growth of the cancer cell. What that mutation also does is enable or disable, actually, treat, treatment with a certain group of anti-cancer medicines. To say that more clearly, that if a patient's tumor ha has the KRAS mutation, unfortunately we are unable to use drugs like Herbitux or Vectabix because they don't work. They just don't work. And they actually cause more toxicity and patients do worse and we should not give it to them if their tumors ha harbor this mutation. So we the focus of, of the data presented at the, at the conference was a few studies that pointed out that we need to do more extensive genetic testing for this RAS, KRAS gene mutation beyond the routine analysis that we're doing because they picked up about 18% more mutations by extending the testing from what we usually do. So soon will become a new standard to increase the testing, the number of genes that we test for. So we really can tell, um, look, examining the whole gene, does, it, does the patient's cancer possess any one of these RAS mutations, which would make, um, which would help us make treatment decisions. We don't want to give it patients a drug that is not going to help them and could potentially harm them. So we need this gene mutation data to accurately predict this information. Lastly, I want to um, highlight a, a another study that was presented at ASCO GI that is a novel technology that um, had some interesting results, and this is these are early results, but what, what I found uh, intriguing is that there probably will be new treatments coming down the road for patients that have metastatic disease, and these are not typical chemotherapies. What this treatment is is called Debiri, D-E-B-I-R-I, and Debiri are drug-eluting beads, so little beads that have irenotecan chemotherapy inside the beads, and these beads are delivered directly into the hepatic artery. The hepatic artery is an, an artery in the liver that supplies blood to tumors. The hepatic artery does not supply blood to the normal liver. It only supplies blood to tumors. So the, the purpose of putting these beads into the hepatic artery that then give off irinotecan is that there will be a more direct delivery of irinotecan, which is an active chemotherapy in colon cancer, or colorectal cancer, to the tumors in the liver. So this study looked at the addition of these beads to first-line full FOX chemotherapy in patients that have liver-only metastatic disease. So a patient is diagnosed with colon cancer that's metastatic to the liver only, and they giving the beads with full FOX chemotherapy in the first time they're treated to downstage them, meaning to shrink it down, and then hopefully take out these tumors in the liver. And what they were able to find was that the addition of these beads to full FOX was able to downstage and then subsequently operate on more than a third of the patients on the trial. So that I find very promising that, and this was 70 patients that were, that were studied in this phase two trial. So what this means now is that 
we, we're going to study this in more patients, and hopefully this will become a new additional treatment for patients that have liver metastases. Irene TKM beads are administered to the hepatic artery during the off week of chemotherapy so that it's tolerated. We can do this at the same time as chemotherapy, and this is all done as an outpatient procedure. So this is a um, intriguing new data that needs more investigation, but it, it's hopefully something that will be coming, coming out in the future to help patients that have liver uh, disease, metastatic disease of the liver. The next slide is, is your thoughts, my thoughts, conclusions, and questions. So I'm going to start with personalized medicine. I'll, that was the subject of, the, of this talk today, was personalized medicine. What does it mean for you? Uh, what, what I think um, you need to take home from all of this is that it is very important to ask your doctor about the genetics of your tumor. You need to ask them, say, what is my... What is my uh, mutate? What are the mutations of my tumor? Is there anything that you can test about the tumor that would change your therapy? That would would make you be able to use a certain drug in this treatment? We want to use these tests to help guide therapy. So patients probably don't even know that we are even looking into these tests to try to decide on therapy, but we are. Um, so it's important as you're trying to figure out what your options are to ask your doctor about the genetics of the tumor, to ask your doctor about the KRAS mutations of the tumor, and then lastly, ask your doctor about genome sequencing. Well, what is that? That's taking a piece of your tumor that's in the pathology lab, that's out of your body, and subjecting it to a bunch of molecular tests to come up with basically a, a molecular profile of the tumor that tells you that, uh, I'm just giving an example here, that KRAS is mutated, but BRAS is mutated also. And, oh, interestingly, we, in patients that may be needing a new treatment option, we have a trial now that that is looking at a new drug that targets patients that have a BRAS mutation, which is a different mutation in the KRAS family. So it's important to do these genome sequencing of the tumor so we can get more information as to what exactly is driving the growth of these cells. And hopefully we are testing new drugs to target these pathways that are being triggered by these gene changes. So that's what I, I want you all to take home from this is that make, don't be afraid to ask about the genetics of your tumor, about the mutations that exist in the tumor, and about what drugs may or may not be available for you based on this information. And lastly, um, I, I want to I want to encourage all of you to take advantage of the of the excellent educational websites that the Colon Cancer Alliance provides, that Fight Colorectal Cancer provides, and then of another foundation which is close, very close to my heart, a uh, foundation that I started called Michael's Mission, is also an informative uh, colorectal cancer supportive care website. Take advantage of these websites. These websites have so much information. They, they will connect you to other patients and survivors. They will connect you to, to um, novel treatments. They will connect you to the places where they're doing these trials. They will connect you to, um, uh, if they need uh, patients, that a, lot, a lot of times I've seen um, certain clinical trials basically advertising, saying we want patients that have tumors that are XYZ on this trial to test a new therapy. And, and you know, these these advocacy organizations and websites, educational websites, are the place to go to get your information. So, so really take advantage of them. And in the last few minutes that we have, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I'm going to start with uh, questions that may have come in during my talk, and then I will, um, after that, I will highlight some questions that I have already received. Thank you very, very much for your attention, and I hope it was educational, informative, inspiring. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Ocean. Uh, we are for a wonderful presentation and great information, so very valuable. We speak with so many stage four folks with METs that uh, these clinical trials and some of these new treatment options are going to be so exciting for them and give them so much more hope. Uh, would you like to go ahead and um, take uh, some of the uh, questions that were submitted previously? We just have a few moments. Okay, sure. I'm gonna, sure. going to have to apologize for those that submitted them online. We'll do our best to get back to each of those who submitted their questions online directly after uh, we're completed with the presentation. Right. Definitely, we can. I can even write them up and we can post them so that everybody can see them. So the majority of the questions um, came in about, and I'll just list a few of them because a few of them are, are they're all similar. How will personalized medicine change my treatment plan? Well, I I think I highlighted that. I you know we want to use these the information that we can that we can find out about a patient's individual tumor to help guide therapy and. Um, instead of practicing medicine in um, in the unknown, we now are able to find out so much more about the tumor. So we want to use that to to our advantage to help decide, you know, what we what medicines we should use, which ones are the, are likely to work, which ones are likely not to work. We don't want to waste time with medicines that don't work. Um, okay. So um, the next question was, can personalize medicine predict my ability to tolerate chemo and side effects. We're not exactly at that uh, point yet where we can predict um, these markers don't predict whether or not patients will tolerate chemo. Um, we are looking at some markers that may predict what, whether or not a patient will develop a certain toxicity, um, but it, it's um, they're not necessarily markers from the tumor. Um, for instance, if you take the side effect of neuropathy, which is very, very um, important for patients that, you know, are, are getting treated for colon cancer because of it, it can be a very um, painful and disabling side effect uh, if it happens, we are looking at um, changes in, in, the, in the genes that affect nerve development uh, to see why certain patients develop chemo-related neuropathy and others don't, um, and also what, like, what, what we can do to ameliorate it. Um, so that's one example of how, I guess, personalized medicine is predicting chemo side effects. But right now we're not we're using it more to predict uh, what medicines to, to use, not so much for side effects. Um, the next um, question is, Um, can genetic testing or personalized medicine be used to predict who needs to be screened? I really like this question because, um, you know, the bottom line is that we need to catch this before it happens. And we, right now, the tests that I mentioned that we're doing on the tumors um, cannot be used to predict who needs to be screened. But what we can do to predict who needs to be screened is, is getting a really good family history and figuring out if patients fall, uh, fall under the classification of having hereditary colon cancer or not. And those patients and their family members need to be screened much more vigorously and much earlier in age because they are at very high risk for developing colorectal cancer over time. So um, we can't use these uh, markers but we, we have other genetic testing markers that we can use to predict who, who needs to be screened, and th those are mostly for the familial patients. Um, in, and there, there was a, a bunch of questions related to side effects that came in. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, – yeah, I'm going to probably have to defer those to another time. Um, there, there was – uh, one one was um, why do I have to have a chemo pump? Um, just in 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 answering that question quickly, um, the pump is is a way of delivering infusional chemotherapy, and which has been the 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 stand standard way to deliver chemotherapy. But I mentioned to you that um, the oral 
um, drug called capecitabine or Zolota, so you may want to ask your doctor if that's an option for you instead of the pump. Um, and another tr um, question is chemo always every other week. Most regimens are dosed every other week or sometimes every three weeks, depending on, on what regimen someone's on, and that's because a lot of work was done in in the um, the pharmacokinetics of 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 the medicines, like when do they reach maximum uh, um, volume in the body? When do the medicines reach that, and when do they come out of your system? So that that's the dosing interval is based on that. So um, um, usually that's when it's given. Um, there's a there's a um a question here that says will the neuropathy ever get better um neuropathy is a very very hard side effect if it is painful for people um i would ask your doctor to um uh see if there we did a study with um cymbalta um which is an antidepressant which was shown to reduce the symptoms of of peripheral neuropathy and to improve symptoms. So I would ask your doctor if, if that is an option for you. Um, also, um, vitamin B6, pyridoxine, has been shown to help with neuropathy, so that may be something that you can do. And I'll ask your doctor about, um, uh, let's see what else. Um, and then um, this is a, um, a hard question to to conquer in a minute, but I'll, but I'll do my best. Uh, what is your best advice to get your oncology team to talk to each other? It seems a tall order in my clinic. Most of the communicating done between radiologists, oncologists, etc., is done through the patient. What would you suggest a patient to do to try and change the culture of their clinic toward a more integrative approach? Well, I guess I have to say that, you know, the, um, the squeaky wheel is the, is the approach you have to take. You have to voice, you have to tell your doctor that that you want to be included in these discussions um, regarding the treatment decisions. I, I think it's I think it's very good that um, centers do present cases in a multidisciplinary setting, so they have a lot of doctors there that are discussing, um, you know, what's the be next best step in, in treating patients. But they need to relay that to you um, and come back and tell you what the discussion was. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to change the culture of a clinic in, in an easy way. Um, but I, I, I think the best way to um, to do it is just to tell your doctor that you you would appreciate a more interactive and integrative approach to your treatment and and don't be afraid to even ask a doctor who you're if you're interviewing a doctor to decide on what doctor to go with you know ask them that say how 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 much am, am I a part of this team um you know am I going to be able to to be an active member here or is this just going to be like you're going to tell me what to do all the time so i would ask your doctor you know going forward um if you're trying to decide about which oncologist to use you know Ask them that, it, you know, how integrative. I think it's a great question. It's a really hard question to answer. And and um, I'm going to stop now um, and see if there's any burning questions from, that came in, and then otherwise we'll, we'll definitely report the answers to, the, to all the questions that came in at another time. Thanks so much, Dr. Ocean. And I think like, uh, like she just said, we'll have to respond to all the questions we weren't able to get to on this webinar. Uh, a little bit later, so I apologize that we weren't able to address everyone's questions, but we will respond uh, afterwards. Um, thanks again, Dr. Ocean, for just all of your uh, insight through your presentation and in answering our questions. Thank you, Randy and Kim, for being here as well, and thank you to everyone who was able to join us on this webinar. It's been uh, wonderful having you. Thank Ladies you. And Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's presentation. You may log off your phone line. Log off your webinars and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.